The Basketball Hall of Fame 60 Days of Summer is your chance to see your favorite basketball stars live and in person. Check hoophall.com for a complete list of all these exciting appearances and plan your trip today. Guys, Rod Strickland, 17 years in the NBA, nine different teams, uh, fantastic career. Uh, just tell us quickly here, where, where, you, where did you come in from today to be able to get to us at the Hall of Fame? Uh, I came in from, first of all, thanks everybody for coming out. It's good to see all y'all out there. Appreciate it. Uh, coming in from Tampa, Florida, um, I'm, I'm coaching uh, at the University of South Florida. Well, this is my second year there. Okay, okay good spot for you. Uh, tell us a little bit a little about your background, where you grew up, what life, what life was like as a kid. I mean, we have a lot of kids here that, you know, have an, obviously have an interest in basketball. Yeah, well, I'm from uh, New York City, South Bronx. Uh, grew up playing basketball. Uh, I would say since I'm a lot of you young guys' age, I've probably been playing basketball since I was five, six years old. Uh, my oldest, well, my middle brother told me how, taught me how to shoot at probably the age of eight years old, and I've been playing organized basketball since I was nine. Uh, you know, always loved basketball, always out in the park, always had a ball in my hand, no matter what I was doing. So, hey, what, did, what did basketball mean to you as a kid? I mean, how important was it in, in your daily life and, and what you did growing up? Well, it was important for me. Well, I looked up to my two oldest brothers, uh, and they played basketball, so I kind of wanted to be like them. So I kind of followed them around, uh, and just tried to emulate them. And uh, so that's, that, that, that's what started me loving basketball, probably wanting to be like my big brothers. I'm going to take a wild guess. It didn't take you long to be a pretty good basketball player. No, I was pretty good. At the age of 9 and 10, I was playing with the older guys a little bit. And my, my trick was that I would always pass them the ball. So they always wanted me on their team. And keep them I, happy, yeah. I keep them happy. And then I throw in a behind-the-back pass so they can get excited. So I stayed on the court because of that. How long, do you remember how long it was until you could beat one of your older brothers one-on-one? -on -one? Wow. Uh, really, I was trying to beat my middle brother. My oldest brother wasn't as good. Uh, I want to say it probably took till college. Really? Yeah, because he was really, really, really good. And actually, he played in uh, uh, one of the summer pro leagues. I forgot the name of it, but he scored like 63 points. Your older brother did. Yeah, so he was, he was really good. So it took a long time to beat him. But once I beat him once, it was over with. <laughs> you got over the hump, yeah. Yeah, I got over got the hump. Got into his mind a little yes. bit. Do you remember how old you were when you realized that maybe basketball could take me you know, places in life? You know, I don't know when you started thinking about playing in high school or college or even beyond. Well, it, it was a little different back then. You know, a lot of we started kids coming out of high school and playing in the NBA. So it kind of made the younger kids look at the pros at junior high school and high school like I can be a pro. Well, back then, it was, I was in junior high school wondering if I could be good in high school. And I was in high school wondering if I could be good okay. in college. So it was different steps. So I didn't, I didn't really recognize that I could become a pro till after my freshman year in college. Okay, now how did the competition, I'm sure there's great competition in the Bronx, New York City, how yes. did that prepare you for the, for the higher levels that you, you eventually achieved? Uh, I think it just it made me very, very competitive because uh, New York City, uh, especially back then, were known for that was known really for basketball. If you came from New York City, that was a big deal. So everybody in the park played a lot. We played a lot in the park on concrete, on cement, and there was a lot of guys who could play. So even if you had a name, if you was a pro, you had to always kind of battle guys. So for me, coming up as a name, potential pro, every time I stepped out on the court, I had to win. And it wasn't just winning the game, I had to win the battle of whoever I was playing against. So, Otherwise, it would go around the city that, you know, <laughs> I've lost and he bust my behind. So I always had to be on my A game, which kept me competitive. You had to, you had to prove yourself every single game. Every single game against every single person. Now you got a nice honor coming out of the school system in New York. You're part of the New York Basketball Hall of Fame? Yes, yes. And there's got to be a list of some pretty good players that came out of you know, that part of the country. Oh, absolutely. It was a big time honor. Uh, you know, it's funny, after you play for all those years, I never was one to kind of look at the accolades and, and was really into awards and all that. But once I retired and was able to, to be honored at the New York uh, Basketball Hall of Fame, that was big time for me. 
Now you went on, uh, Rod, to star at Oak Hill. Yes. Uh, top program in the country for so many years in Virginia. Yes. Uh, what, at that point, obviously, you knew that your basketball was going to be able to take you to a, a, a higher level. Uh, was that an easy choice to leave home, or what, what kind of adjustment did you have to make you know, just in your own life to, to, to leave and yeah. start well, anew? Well, I don't think, I still didn't know how good I was, you know, back then. You know, I still was trying to find myself if I was, I was being recruited by everybody, but I still had the, those questions, you know, am I good enough to play in college? So I still was figuring myself out. But uh, I went to Truman High School before Oak Hill. Okay. We won a state championship the previous year. My high school coach left and went to Villanova. Steve Lapis, who actually coached at the University of Massachusetts. Certainly, yeah. Yeah, so he was my high school coach. He went to Villanova. They brought in another coach, and I decided to leave. And actually, Lap helped me find Oak Hill Academy. I knew nothing about Oak Hill Academy. So to me, it was on the other side of the world. Sure. Uh, you go down the road, and it was cows and, <laughs> yeah. and horses. There was <laughs> nothing around the city. It's in Mouth of Wilson, Virginia. You know, so I was kind of culture shocked for a minute there. But it was a great, great, great situation for me. Now, that program at Oak Hill, you, you, I'm sure you did extensive travel, played against some of the top teams and players around the country. I mean, even at, at that point, did that give you the taste? Like, you know what, this, this is probably going to be what college looks like. Is that when you really started thinking about college? Uh, well, it, it definitely gave me a taste, and we definitely traveled. But I, was, I grew up uh, in New York City with the New York Gauchos, so I had been traveling since I was okay. 13 years old. So I kind of had a taste for that a little bit. But Oak Hill just took the competitiveness up another level, you know, because I was playing with guys. When I was in Truman, I was the guy, and you knew that. But okay. at Oak Hill, I had a lot of other guys with me. So it, it became more competitive. And then I was playing against better competition. Okay, and then you, you get to the point where you decide on college, uh, DePaul University near Chicago, in Chicago. Yes. Um, I think it's a program that maybe the younger generation here probably doesn't quite understand how formidable that program was in particular through the, what, 70s and 80s. Yeah. A great opportunity f for you there. You guys were always a fixture in the NCAA tournament. Talk about what, what life was like at DePaul. Well, DePaul University uh, back then, what was that, 85? Uh, in the, 80s, 90s, and probably uh, previous, it was a big time program. It was a top 10 program in the country. So uh, I went to DePaul because they were an up-tempo style of basketball team, and then they were on national TV all the time. You know, y'all are lucky now. We have so many uh, channels out here, but back then we didn't have all these channels. So DePaul University played on NBC and CBS probably seven, eight times a year total. Right. And then there was a station called WGN, which was national. So every game, Chicago, uh, DePaul played on WGN. So every game was on national TV. So I wanted to be seen. I wanted people to see me play. I wanted them to see that I could play. So I, I went to DePaul for those reasons. Well, a lot of people did see you play. People took notice. The guys at the NBA offices and programs, obviously, 1988 draft, your first round pick of the hometown New York Knicks. Yes. Is that, could that have started any better for you as far as being a hometown team? I don't know if you were a Knicks fan growing up. I was a Knicks fan growing up, but I was a big uh, Philadelphia, Dr. J, uh, Mo Cheeks fan, uh, Magic Johnson, Laker fan. So I wasn't a total Knicks fan okay. like, like that. So the funny thing is, and I'm sure you guys know Mark Jackson, he was the, the uh, New York Knicks point guard, and he had just, he just received Rookie of the Year award. And so I'm coming in that second year, so I was kind of surprised that they picked me, and really, honestly, didn't want to go there. <laughs> okay. I mean, honestly. But, uh, you know, so I was there for about a year and a half, and obviously they had to make a decision, you know, because they had two really, really good point guards. And so, you know, I wanted to move it on. But, but I was surprised to go to the Knicks. I, I didn't think I, was, I, I would get drafted by the Knicks. Did you take that opportunity to learn from Mark Jackson? Or was it a tough <laughs> situation where, like, he's probably thinking, what, this kid's coming and he's going to yeah. take my job? Yeah, it wasn't no learning from Mark Jackson. It was, it was constant battles. We were, we, were, we were going at it. You know, right. we, we were real young, a year apart. 
you know, we feel in our mojo. So we, we, we were very, very, very competitive. Well, you, you learn that way. That's a good way to yeah, learn as well, yeah, yeah. Uh, even if he doesn't take you under his wing. 17 yeah. seasons, nine NBA teams. Uh, which team do you identify most? You know, if you, uh, it, I don't know if there were a particular team where someone said Rod Strickland, he played for, you can't list off all nine teams. Right, right. I'm trying to forget that, like nine teams, <laughs> Jesus Christ. But no, I think Portland and Washington is where I played most of my uh, career. I think out of those two teams, I played 10 years. So that would be, I guess that, that would be the teams that most people may know me from. Unless you're from New York, obviously. I started in New York, grew up in New York, but those are the two teams. Well, was it tough to move around so much? I know a lot of it, I mean, we probably take it for granted when a family here moves like maybe once or twice in a lifetime. Yeah. That's a difficult transition. Now here you are. Yeah, well, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Uh, I think at the end of my career is when I did most of my moving. Okay. You know, for the first 12 years, like I said, I played 10 years in those two cities. Uh, my last five years, I was getting older, so I had to move around. You know, each year I probably, I was on a different team. So that was kind of, well, it wasn't that hard for me. I had younger kids, so they didn't really feel it as much. But, okay, uh, right. so it was, it was okay. It was, uh, okay. was it a, um, is it hard or easy? To, I don't know if you take it personal when somebody trades, so when somebody trades you, it might mean they don't want you, but it means the other team wants you. I mean, how do you balance that mix of emotions? Well, I didn't get traded a whole lot. I got traded twice. You know, the other times I was free agents or whatever, so that wasn't a big deal. I got traded from New York to San Antonio, and I got traded from Portland to Washington. So and you, both times I wanted to get traded, so that's not <laughs> <laughs> So you had, the, you had the opportunity to choose where you, you know, like anybody else with a job here, you could choose to move to the company across the street or to a different... Yeah, as a free agent, yeah, yeah I had the opportunity to go where I wanted to go. Now, these career numbers for you, Rod, uh, you ranked 10th all-time in assists in the NBA, and, and you've been out of the game for 10 years, so you've given guys, yeah. guys have had a chance to catch up with you a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I think you're number 64 in games played. I mean, that's a pretty significant yeah. uh, statistic. When I poked around at a little background on you, looking on the internet, um, I think one of the words that kind of came up was that you were underrated. Now, I don't quite know what that means or if, mm -hmm. if it just added motivation to you that mm -hmm. you know, people didn't maybe entirely appreciate what you did on the basketball mm -hmm. court? Well, I don't know. I'm top 30 in steals, too. Top 30 in steals, okay. Been, nah, nah, but uh, I don't know. I, for, for me, I think everybody that I played with and played against, you know, respect what I've done over those 17 years. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. You know, I, I've been blessed to play 17 years in the NBA. You know, yeah. whoever you feel uh, underappreciated over, I appreciate the fact that I played 17 years. It's not many guys who can say that. Uh, so, I mean, I've been blessed, so it's, it's a good thing. I'm, I'm going to read a quote here. It came from Maurice Cheeks. And if anybody, the older, maybe the older generation remembers Maurice Cheeks, and you said he was kind of an idol growing up. And yeah. I guess once upon a time, you got actually traded for him. What Mo Cheeks had said is, the mark of any true player is someone is that someone doesn't want to play against him. I'm sure guys around the, re around the league say that when they have to play Rod. So that, that's a pretty high compliment from somebody. And I know, I mean, anybody here who plays basketball, there's usually somebody, you're like, oh my gosh, I got to go up against this guy. And it sounds like you were that guy in the NBA. Yeah, well, that's a big compliment coming from Mo Cheese, because like I said, I idolized him uh, growing up, uh, watching him play with Julius Irvin. So uh, I, I actually just, in the last five years, I saw that quote. I, I, you know, I didn't know that was out there. <laughs> but uh, to hear that from him, you know, that, that's big time. 17 years in the NBA, do you remember, I mean, maybe at least statistically, 1997 to 98, 18 points a game, 11 assists. I don't know if that kind of, if, you break, if you're able to break it down that much, does that qualify maybe as your best season? Or maybe uh, st uh, statistically wise, for sure. You know, and I probably would say, yeah. I mean, I think I led the league in, in assists that year. Uh, and I think I made all NBA second team that year. So that was a big, yeah, that was a big year. Yeah, certainly. Now you had an opportunity to play, obviously you had some great players in 17 years. The one name that always seems to pop up is Michael Jordan. What was it like to play? Mm -hmm. What was it like to play against him? Uh, I'm just glad I had to guard him. Like, uh, I mean, everybody knows his history. He was a great player, great competitor. Uh, and we, I think I rarely, rarely beat him, you know? So 
did, did you have to approach it like he would just happen to be another guy who's wearing the number 23 in a red uniform? Well, I mean, as an NBA player and a competitor, you going out there, you playing against. I'm, I'm not going to look at Michael Jordan like you may look at Michael no. Jordan because I know I got to go compete against him. You know, obviously I know how great of a player he is, but at the end of the day we're competing. And so you have on a red jersey, I have on a white jersey. Now, if you were an NBA coach and you break, you know, you know some pregame strategy, your team's going out to play a team that's led by point guard Rod Strickland. How would you defend? How would you have defended Rod Strickland? What would you have done to maybe limit what you could do on the court? I might have double or triple team. No, let me stop. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I think for most people, they would give me the jump shot. You know, uh, probably play back off me a little bit, and uh, you know, see if I hit shots. Okay. Now, if we were going to make a movie, you know, the the life, the NBA life of Rod Strickland. We're looking for a, not an actor, but maybe somebody who's currently in the NBA. Who might best play you? Who would, be, who would you be most comparable to now in today's NBA, skill-wise? If you could say, hey, you know what? You never saw me play, but I look a lot like this guy. Uh, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm bad at comparisons. <laughs> I really am. I, I don't know. Well, you're truly know. one of a kind, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm bad at comparisons. Well, I, I'll, um, this leads into my next question. Uh, Obviously, one of the best players in the world at this point in the NBA, for sure, Kyrie Irving. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it, you, once in a while you hear comparisons, his game to yours, right. number one. And number two, you have a neat connection with him as his godfather. Yes. And that's yeah. a pretty cool thing. And maybe you can let people know how that all came about. Yeah, well, I'm Kyrie Irving's godfather. Uh, me and his father grew up playing basketball. Uh, we've known each other since the third grade. Uh, so. I mean, basically, we we spent almost every day of, of our lives together growing up in, in the Bronx. We grew up playing AAU together. Uh, you know, while I was in the NBA, you know, basically, we were in it together. So, you know, we talked to each other all the time. His family, you know, his family, my family, great, great connection. So I'm guessing you may have been rooting for the Cavs in the NBA Absolutely. Finals? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you have a favorite team at this point? I mean, if you were to sit down and watch a game at home, they say, you know what, I really want to check this game because Team X is playing. Yeah, no, I don't know if I have a favorite team. Obviously, I'm following Kyrie. I want to see him play. I want to see Cleveland do well. I wanted them to win the championship. Uh, so I love watching them play. I love watching the Spurs play as a coach just to yeah. kind of see how they play together. Uh, but I watch games a lot now because I have, I have kids. So I always tell my sons, if Kyrie's playing, if Chris Paul is playing, if Steph Curry is playing, if Tony Parker's playing, you better be in front of the TV. Yeah, right. Because you should be watching those guys because those are the guys. Well, tell me a little bit, bit about your kids. You and John Wall, my man. John Wall, too. Yes. Don't forget him. Yes. Uh, you have four kids. Yes. Two boys, two girls. Yes. Some are all play basketball? Uh, three of them are basketball players. My oldest daughter, uh, she's in college in, in Florida, but she doesn't play. Um, I have a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old that play, uh, and I have a 9-year-old daughter that plays. Any particular advice you give to them? I know you can't push it on it. It's got to come naturally to the kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you give them any particular advice as far as? Oh, the boys, I push. They, they ain't had no choice. <laughs> they on the court. <laughs> but, no, nah, they love it. They've been around it so much, you know, especially not so much with me playing because they were really young, but me coaching at Memphis with, you know, Derrick Rose, Tariq Evans, then at Kentucky with John Wall and Brandon Knight and all those guys. So they've been around it. They love it. You know, those are like big brothers to them. So, uh, but, but all I tell them is just to watch, you know, watch and emulate guys. You know, you, you watch the best ones and, and you take those qualities out of them. Right. And, you know, obviously the, my kids are, are great students, 3.5, 3.7. Uh, students, so I'm big time on, on, on education and just being, a, being competitive, being a good person, giving back, just, you know, the, the, the everyday things you should be doing as, sure. as, as somebody. In. As, as anybody. Do, do they often ask about your career? I mean, you watch games and you could, you could probably lean over every 30 seconds and say, I used yeah. to do that. I did yeah. that. I played there. And I do that to them. You they do. Don't, good. They don't so like they, that. But, uh, no. They, my kids are funny because they talk bad about me. So they look, they look for highlights of me messing up. 
they, no respect, huh? Yeah, so they have a, you know, Akeem Olajuwon, one of the greatest of all time. I think he ran me down on a fast break and blocked my shot. So they run that back and forth, back and forth. They tell their friends about that. So they find all the bad things that happen on the court with me. And, you know, that's, that's, that's how they do me. So, so YouTube and the internet isn't always your favorite, isn't, isn't your friend at this point? No, and I used to make them sit down and watch my games. <laughs> But they get a little older now. So. That'll, that'll teach you. Yeah. Um, basketball players have, you know, we all have our own styles, idiosyncrasies, you know, even the way we dress or whatever, even numbers we choose for jerseys if we can. Any superstitions or any like pregame routines that you always try to go through? No, I never. I was, I, was, I was different. And I don't think everybody really liked the way I prepared at times. I was a little different. I was a little different. I, yeah. Everybody loves a good buzzer beater. I mean, you're shooting in the driveway or wherever you're playing, and you're going to knock down an 18-footer to win the NBA Finals. Did you have any, any particular shots in your career, any buzzer beaters that, that stand out more than others? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know if any stand out than others. I mean, I've had some. Uh, but for me, just the, just the whole competitive thing, you know, like the, the, the biggest thing I miss about, about playing in the NBA is the preparation you know, or walking out that tunnel to the court, right. you know, being in that locker room, uh, competing every day in practice, you know, those are the things. So in general, you know, I, I just look back at it and, you know, every, every, every part of the game was special, you know, even the, the losses, the wins, the clutch shots, the, the, the bad memories, the right. bad shots, the turnovers, like it just all was a process. Now, now, on that note, looking at your career stats, I think you took 12,000 12, shots in the NBA. If you could like, ma wave a magic wand and make one of those misses, turn that into a make, is there any one shot that you could say, you know what, if I made that shot, if that, if that ball had fallen, things might have been different. We might have won this game. I don't know if you got one. That well, I have, I have, it's not a shot. It's a pass, if I could take it back. <laughs> it was a pass, OK. Yeah, it was a, in the playoff game. Uh, I was with the San Antonio Spurs, and we were playing against Portland Trailblazers. And we actually, it was game seven, and it was to go to the conference final. And I threw a behind the head pass to Sean Elliott, thinking he was going to cut to the basket, but he veered out to the corner, turned it over. Clyde Drexler stole the ball, went down court. I fouled him, breakaway foul. So two shots in the ball, and I fouled out. Yep. So I didn't even have a chance to redeem myself. So I would take that. If I could take that go. back. OK, maybe we can. Yeah. figure out a way to turn back yeah, time. But of all that. the great things you did in the NBA, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if a play like that sticks longer with you than the, the 10,000 great plays you made. No, not really. I mean, I mean, I shouldn't say that. It does stick out because that was a moment, but it doesn't stick out any more than anything else. You know, at the end of the day, you're going to succeed. You're going to fail. You're going to have good games, bad games. You're going to miss clutch shots. You're going to make clutch shots. So you have to, it all has to roll off your back it, yeah. and you can't take yourself too serious because otherwise the pressure will get to you and we all have pressure and it's how you kind of deal with it. So with me, it's, it's part of the game. Okay. If you guys are just walking in, this is part of our 60 Days of Summer uh, program here at the Hall of Fame. We're talking with Rod Strickland, 17 seasons in the NBA, number 10 all time in career assists. He played for nine different NBA teams. Uh, you were a first round pick, as we mentioned, in 1988 draft. Draft just happened a couple weeks ago. Um, you played for the Timberwolves, Coach Flip Saunders. Yes. They drafted Carl uh, Anthony Towns. Yes. Um, you have a you have a little background, a connection with him. You saw yes. him, or you coached him. Yes. Dominican National, Dominican Republic National Team. Yes. How um, any words of advice for him being a first round pick and and maybe playing in Minnesota and for Coach Saunders? Well, I think with Carl, he, the the advice I would give him is to just work hard. Be prepared for all the distractions. Uh, dedicate himself to the to the gym and to the court, and being positive and giving back and helping other people. Uh, but Carl is a very very ambitious kid, and he wants to be the best. So I, I look for big things for him. He's a great kid, great competitor, great family. You know, a great student. Like I think he's Minnesota's done well by picking him because he's going to be everything you would want a kid to be, you know, in this NBA and trying to grow up in that NBA life and lifestyle. Right. I think he'll be great. 
Now, you, obviously, we, we talked about how basketball has been part of your entire life, um, including the 17 years in the NBA. As soon as you retired in, what, 2005? 2005, yeah. You jump right into the coaching ranks, had the opportunity to coach uh, under or with Coach Calipari. Yes. Memphis, Kentucky. Now you've moved on to South Florida. Yes. How much of the coaching experience uh, have you enjoyed? What, what kind of, you know, what does Rod Strickland have to offer to the coaching ranks? Well, I, I enjoy it a lot. And for the most part, it, just being able to deal with, with, with the players, you know, because obviously I was that player before, and I know the, the good and the bad. I know the pitfalls. I know what it takes to be a pro and how you got to go about it. So to be able to kind of give them a little bit of that wisdom as well as helping them on their game and teaching them new things, you know, that's the reward for me. You know, I've been doing this for myself for 17 years, and I can't do it anymore. So now to be able to sit there and, and watch them grow and get better, you know, that's like rewarding for me. How, uh, I'm sure you get to play quite a bit, or at least through the, you know, with guys in the college ranks. How much do you miss playing the actual game, the competitive part of it? Oh, I miss it. I tell, every, I tell them that all the time. I miss it every day, you know. Sometimes when they running out for the starting lineup, I get chills because, you know, I, I miss that competition. So, I mean, I miss it every day. I'm not, a, I'm not even ashamed to say it. Like, I, 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 I still play. And if I could play to 70, I'll still be playing pickup ball and – you know, I mean, that's just been a part of my life. I'm, I'm a basketball guy, so I love basketball. Is it, is it, do you still feel like you're 22, 24 years old or something? In my mind, in, in your my mind. head. How about your knees in and my, stuff? Well, I'm, I'm not that bad. I still can one, two step you, so, I'm, but, I, but, I, but I still play. I play against the players sometimes. You know, I, I play some pickup with them at times. You know, I'm not as quick, obviously. I'm going to get tired quick, but yeah. I enjoy it. Uh, just a reminder to you guys, in about five minutes, we're going to have a question and answer opportunity for you guys. If you have any questions um, you want to ask these guys, we're going to point them this way, Steve. Over here, um, some of the Hall of Fame staff will come around and maybe raise your hand and get, catch their attention uh, if you want to have an opportunity. We'll take about five or six people to come up and ask a question directly to Rod here in a few minutes. Um, mentors, you know, such a big part of life in general, especially basketball. Mm -hmm. uh, any particular players that you've fallen under that mentorship role as a younger guy that you can point back to? No, I probably I wish I probably wish I could have had uh, a little more of that, but I think it's different now. The high school and uh, NBA is so connected. Even you know the younger kids, there's so much more access. Back then, when I was growing up, we didn't have that access. You know. I can remember seeing a couple pros come around the neighborhood and, you know, we saw them from a distance and said hi. But, you know, we never really had all of this, you know. Now, so. how about coaches? I mean, you obviously we just a great track record of top-notch yeah. coaches. Any yeah. coaches that kind of stick with you? And, and, and have you found that some of their philosophies have transferred, you know, maybe when you're coaching a practice in South Florida, you're like, oh, my gosh, that I just said what, you know, Coach Joe said to me 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah, well, no, I th the, the biggest thing that stands out for me is my, my AAU coach, uh, Dave McCollins, who, who was a coach at the Gauchos AAU program. He's the one who started me uh, uh, in organized basketball. And he always taught us from day one at 9 and 10 years old how to dribble with your right hand, dribble with your left hand, uh, how to shoot techniques. Like, we were, we were uh, instructed. You know, so I always, I've, I've, I've carried that along with me. So as I'm coaching, you know, I'm real meticulous and real on point about, you know, uh, the fundamentals and skill work and, and knowing how to use both hands. So I think I, I carried that over from, from, from him. And how do you find the coaching where you now, you, now you're on the sidelines, you're not the guy with the ball, you can't make that pass, you can't make that defensive stop. It's mm -hmm. probably, obviously it's a lot all in the preparation, but you probably feel a little bit helpless sitting on the bench in the suit, you know, when, you, when your team needs a bucket laid or, or some kind of big play. Well, you know what, not really, I, but I, you try to help the kids to understand certain situations and how to deal with it, and you would hope, and you would be confident that they're going to be good at it. So, okay. yeah. All right, good job. We're going to bring in a couple guys here. I see a guy in a Magic Johnson 
uh, get up here. Nice job. And we'll have him come up and uh, ask a quick question of you, Rod. So, okay. hey, Magic, come on up. And when you guys come up, just tell us your, uh, maybe your name, where you're from, and if you have a favorite player or a favorite team. Okay. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> my name is Daniel, and uh, I'm from Florida. And my favorite basketball player would be probably either John Havlicek or, what's his name, Oscar Robertson. Dang, that's big time. Two <laughs> great ones, yeah, Hall of Famers. That's history. Uh, what does winning mean to you? Uh, winning, it, it, it probably means that you had a, a, a group of guys collectively that came together and uh, performed well for, for, for one goal. Uh, and, and most of the time when you win, you know, you have, a, you have a team, a great team, and you have a chemistry. So winning, I mean, it's, it's obviously everybody wants to win. That's the best thing. But I think it's the process of, of uh, going about trying to become a winner. It's a whole, a whole lot more fun to win, too. But Daniel, it's definitely fun to win. Daniel from uh, Florida, nice job. Appreciate thank your question. Thank you, thank you. Nice to see a Magic Johnson shirt. Yeah? Yes, yes. My name is Charlie. Um, I'm from South Windsor, Connecticut. Um, my favorite player is Russell Westbrook. And my question for you is, of all the teams that you played on, was there any team you wish you had more time in or on? Yeah, that's a great question, because it is. I, I, I played with the Miami Heat later on in my career. I was older. I was probably on my last leg, but I played for Pat Riley, and I, I enjoyed it. You know, Pat Riley's known for being a hard-nosed coach and a real a guy that pushes you, and, and some people told me, you know, being an older player, that he was going to wear me down, and it was going to be tough, and it was going to be rough, and I actually enjoyed it, and I actually wish that in the beginning of my career, I had an opportunity to play for somebody who, and what the young man was talking about just a minute ago, who was such a winner and was determined about winning. Uh, I, I wish I could have played with him for many years. Like, that's, that's the one coach and the one situation I wish I could have been in a little longer. Okay, Charlie from South Windsor, you got a future, an ESPN reporter, man. Nice job, <laughs> good question. <laughs> <clears throat> Boy, you look seven feet tall right now. <laughs> you want me to hold it? Feel a bit older than everyone else here. Uh, my name's Kyle. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, huge fan. Thank you. Uh, my Thank favorite, you. favorite player would be Patrick Ewing. It's the reason I got into basketball. Uh, my question would be, as a point guard, how does it feel to have the respect of your teammates to you know, tell them what to do, to you know, make the plays and say, go over there mm -hmm. to run the play? What, say that? Oh, sorry. Uh, as a point guard, mm -hmm. what's it like to have the respect of your teammates to tell them what to do? Yeah, well, that's another really good question because when I was at Memphis, I never forget having this conversation with Derrick Rose and Tyreek Evans because they were obviously considering going out early in one year. And the, the biggest thing I told them would be the, the biggest transition for them would be having to go to a team and play with one of the players you've seen all your life and have to tell them where they need to be at to get the ball and also have to tell them at times, you're not getting it right now. You know, so that's a, that's a tough situation to be in, but that's what a point guard is. And, and I think if you go into a situation and you kind of, you're humble, but also command some respect and they know what you're doing, I mean, they know that you know what you're doing, then I think it becomes easy. But as a point guard, you have to be willing to do that, and you have to kind of have that moxie to do that, even if it's a guy who you, you've looked up to forever. But once you step on the court and you're the point guard and the ball's in your hand, you have to be that leader, and you have to show them that you have no fear. Kyle, Kyle from Melbourne, Australia, good luck. Have a safe trip back. It'll probably take you 17 years to get back there. <laughs> NBA career, Rod Strickland.
My name is Justin. I'm from South Windsor, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite player is Paul Pierce. And my question would be, did you have any friendships with one of the players that you've played with? Yes. Uh, and actually, I still talk to Mark Jackson, who's a, a, a commentary uh, a guy on, on NBA TV. Uh, Sam Cassell, I talk to a lot. Uh, those are probably the two guys that I talk to the most. Yeah. Justin from South Windsor, nice job, good question. We'll have time for a couple more questions here before the autograph portion. And Kenny starts. Smith, I forgot. Kenny Smith. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ben Waldo, and I'm from South Windsor, Connecticut. Uh, I don't really have a favorite player, but my, my favorite team is either Memphis or Miami. Okay. Those are my two favorite teams. Okay. And my question for you is, first off, how tall are you? And second of all, do you use that size as an advantage on the court? Like on me, I see that in my sports, I don't really use my size. Good question, good question. I'm 6'3", I'm and I absolutely did use my size on the court. Uh, because I'm 6'3", I probably was one of the taller guards. So I was a, I, I post up a lot. So anytime I saw a smaller guard, I would run him right in that block, and I would call for the ball. So, and, and even on the perimeter, I would just try to use an angle to get to a spot on the court so that I can just shoot over him. So yeah, I definitely, definitely, absolutely use my height as an advantage. And, and Ben, I think it would be a mismatch. I think he could post you up today yeah. if he took him over here underneath the hoop. Nice job. Good question. Ben from yes, South Windsor. Great question. <laughs> All right, we got time for one more question. I'm Ellis. I'm from Hudson, New York. My favorite player is the one, the only, Raj Strickland. My man, I like you already, man. <laughs> and my question is, um, what were some of the things like you practiced on? Like, what were some of the more most important things you practiced on to like get you to that NBA level? Well, I, I think it's, it's kind of a process, but I, as when I was in the, when I first got into the NBA, people said I couldn't shoot, and I probably couldn't. Uh, so I worked on that more. You know, I went to the summer leagues with the rookies when I was a vet, just to practice shooting, just to uh, play games so that I would shoot more jumpers to get comfortable with it. But I was always one who always worked on both hands. So I always worked on my right hand shooting, my left hand shooting, dribbling. And I also worked on backboard shots. Like I, I shot a lot of layups with a lot of spin off the backboard. So when I went up against big guys and I had to jump into their bodies, I would be able to shoot the ball off, off the backboard off an angle. So I practiced trick shots. I would just stand under the basket and throw the ball up in all different kind of angles. Uh, frontwards, backwards, you know, underneath. Uh, so I worked on a lot of trick shots uh, because I knew I was going to play against guys who were bigger than me, and I knew I had to find a creative way to get the ball up. So basically, I worked on everything, you know, and I stayed in the gym uh, every day. You know, I was in the gym working on my game. So I just think it's just, it, you know, a lot of people say what you work on, but I think at the end of the day, you're working on everything. You know, I want to improve my ball handling. I want to improve my jump shooting. I want to improve my passing with both hands. So I think as a, if I was telling a young kid, I would tell him to make sure you can do everything with your left hand that you can do with your right hand. Ellis right. from Hudson, New York, thank you. Great question. And you've got another fan here. He's, yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, you always like that. Uh, we got time for one final question before we start the autographs. Um, Rod, what emotions do you feel when you come here to the Hall of Fame? What, what does this place mean to you here, center court? I mean, it's a special place for everybody here. What does it mean to you? I mean, this is big time for me. Uh, uh, I was just talking, and I'm like, I don't know how anybody could say no to the Hall of Fame. You know, any NBA player, you know, I would think you would love to sit here and be able to talk to, to people about, you know, your career. Because this is, you know, all the great accomplishments are right here. So this is big time. It almost, you know, it's like, it's like playing basketball and 
first stepping into Madison Square Garden as a basketball player, you know, that aura right. and that, like, this is it. You know, the Hall of Fame, this is it. This is what everybody to aspire to be, you know, uh, one day to be, have their pictures up here or their name here. So, like, for me, this is big time. Okay, great stuff. Thank you to Rod Strickland. It's been great to get to know you right, better. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our autograph, the autograph process will start behind us here with these.